Hey, it's 5.02 a.m. July 15th, uh, supposedly 2017. I'm going to pick up with, uh, they were white and they were slaves with white children in chains. I hope all of you have been enjoying the reading of they were white and they were slaves as much as one can actually enjoy uh, this content, which exposes all of the mistreatment of whites even far more than blacks, specifically in the Americas. I hope it's empowering you. Uh, I hope that uh, no matter what race you are, you will understand that there is absolutely no need, no call for any white European, uh, Anglo-Saxon, Caucasian person to apologize to anyone other than our God, the God of the Bible, for mistreating uh, in, in large part in this country and in Europe. We have sunken into a state of uh, not caring much for all of the grace uh, that we have been shown in him redeeming Israel in Christ Jesus of Nazareth, his only born son. That is who we owe an apology to. And it would be far better just to repent, to turn from our ways, to turn from our sins, to turn back to him in faith and be the people he promised that we would be. Remember in Jeremiah thirty-one thirty-three, he made the promise of the new covenant I will write my laws in their inward parts, in their hearts, that it would be in us to naturally want to uh, walk in his ways. I want to actually provide a small quote, which I'm not going to today uh, use this quote uh, for an argument of white uh, European Israel or Anglo-Saxon Israel. But I do want to note something in uh, staying with the context of this book by Hoffman. It is a quote from Sheldon Emery, and he says, you can search the pages of history in every library in the world, and you will find no record of the people of any other race making any effort to help those of a race other than their own. It is only the white race which has given its religion, its talents, its money, and its material wealth to every race on the flat earth. <laughs> All right, back to the book. White Children in Chains The kidnapping of English children into slavery in America is actually legalized during the first quarter of the 17th century. In that period, a large number of the children of poor parents as well as orphaned children were targeted for the white slave trade. These poor white children were described as a plague and a rowdy element. Aristocrats who ran the Virginia Company, such as Sir Thomas Smythe and Sir Edwin Sandys, viewed the children as a convenient pool of slave laborers for the field of the Virginia colony. In their petition to the Council of London in 1618, they complained of the great number of vagrant children in the streets and requested that they might be transported to Virginia as to serve as laborers. A bill was passed in September of 1618 permitting the capture of children aged eight years old or older, girls as well as boys. The eight-year-old boys were to be enslaved for 16 years, and the eight-year-old girls for 14 years, after which it was said they would be given land. Robert C. Johnson the Transportation of Vagrant Children from London, Virginia, 1618-1622, in 
Early Stuart Studies, page 139. A directive was issued for the capture of children in London, empowering city aldermen to direct their constables to seize children on the streets and commit them to the prison hospital at Bridewell, where they were to await shipment to America. Johnson, pages 139 to 140. Their only crime was that they were poor and happened to be found loitering or sleeping in the streets when the constable passed by. Johnson, page 142. Oh, and I do want to point out, now, the reason that I am going to such great pains to cite every one of Hoffman's sources is clearly because those that I have heard that are claiming the opposite or even just something else are not citing all of their sources as Hoffman is his profound amount of sources so it is important that I cite all of these and it is important that Hoffman cite all of these. I can't tell you how many times I've had to listen to or watch people making certain claims that have no source citation. I don't think anyone should really pay any attention other than if they uh, wish to take an idea that somebody has uh, espoused and investigate it. If this person is not citing sources and in this case with the plentitude of sources that Hoffman has cited you dear listener may take these and investigate them yourself now the street was not only the place child slaves were to be procured however the homes of indigent parents with large families were also on the agenda of the slave traders poor English parents were given the opportunity to surrender one or more of their children to the slavers. If they refused, they were to be starved into submission by being denied any further relief assistance from the local government. To carry out the provisions of the Act, the Lord Mayor, Sir William Cockaine, I'm guessing it's Cockaine, <laughs> I don't know, director of, uh, and the alderman, to directed the alderman to make inquiry of those parents overcharged and burdened with poor children whether they wished to send any of them to Virginia. Those who replied negatively were to be told they would not receive any further poor relief from the parish. Johnson, page 142. The grieving parents were assured that the shipment of their children to Virginia would be beneficial to the children because it was a place where under severe masters, they may be brought to goodness. Johnson, page 143. On January of 1620, a group of desperate, terrified English children attempted to break out of Bridewell, where they had been imprisoned while awaiting the slave ships to America. They rose up and fought. Matters were further complicated by the refusal of some of the children to be transported. In late January, a kind of revolt occurred in Bridewell, with some of the ill-disposed among the children declaring their, willing, their unwillingness to go to Virginia. Johnson, page 143. A hasty letter from Sir Edwin Sandys to the King's secretary, Sir Robert Naughton, quickly rectified the situation. On January 31, the Privy Council decreed that if any of the children continued in their obstinance, they would be severely punished. It is possible that one of the children was actually executed as an example to the others. Which is certain is that a month later, the children, mostly boys, were forced on board the ship Duty and transported to Virginia. From thence onward, English male child slaves came to be known as duty boys. Alexander Brown, the first republic in America, page 375. There would be many more shipments of these doomed children bound for the colonies in the years ahead. From that time on, little is known about them except that very few lived to become adults.
when a muster or census of the virginia colony was taken in 1625 the names of only seven boys were listed of the children kidnapped in 1619 all the rest were dead the statistics for the children sent in 1620 are equally grim no more than five were alive in 1625 johnson page 147 on April 30th, 1621, Sir Edwin Sandys presented a plan to the English Parliament for the solution of the threat poor English people posed to the fabulously wealthy aristocracy. Mass shipment to Virginia, they, where they would all be brought to goodness. <laughs> When control of the colony of Virginia passed from the privately held Virginia Company directly to the king, it was deemed more expedient as time went on to privatize the traffic in white children while placing it on an even larger basis to meet the cheap labor needs of all the colonies. In this way, the crown avoided the opprobrium that might have been connected with the further official sale of English children, even as the aristocracy converted expanded this slave trade dramatically. The early traffic in white children to Virginia had proved profitable not only for the Virginia Company, but for the judges and for the officials in England who administered the capture of children. Now consider this. A lot of these things are going on in the, um, the 1600s and the 1700s. You have to figure that many of the people many of the white Anglo-Saxon European people who participated in the Revolutionary War against England were either themselves or the children or relatives in some way or at least had fresh in their mind this history, this legacy of brutality against their own people that was being perpetrated by the crown and Jewish merchants, which were led in some time earlier by good old Oliver Cromwell. So, the reasons why many of the white Anglo-Saxon peoples fought um, for the revolution of America from England and King George, who was massively in debt to Jewish international bankers, which is why he taxed the colonies so harshly. I believe that they would have had far different reasons for their revolt than, of course, what is told to us in our history books. Now it's told to us taxation without representation, right? But they don't go anywhere near um, the depth of the suffering of white European Anglo-Saxons in these colonies. So, <clears throat> J. Farrar, treasurer of the Virginia Company, indicated that he had been approached by the Marshal of London and other officials who had been involved in procuring children for the colony, proclaiming that they were owed a financial reward for their care and travail therein, that they might be encouraged hereafter to take the like pains whensoever they should have again the like occasion. The officials subsequently received the handsome cut for their part in the loathsome traffic in kidnapped white children which they had desired. Susan M. Kingsbury, Ed. The Records of the Virginia Company of London, Volume 1, page 424, and Johnson, pages 144 and 145. This conclusion, between the public and private sphere, generated profits and established a precedent for many more occasions where like pains would be eagerly taken. The precedent established was the cornerstone of the trade in child slaves in Britain for decades to come, a trade whose center after London would become the ports of Scotland. Press gangs and hire of local merchants roamed the streets, seizing by force such boys as seemed proper subjects for the slave trade. Children were driven in flocks through the town and confined for shipment in barns. 
So flagrant was the practice that people in the countryside about Aberdeen avoided bringing children into the city for fear they might be stolen. And so widespread was the collusion of merchants, shippers, suppliers, and even magistrates that the man who exposed it was forced to recant and run out of town. <laughs> Van der Zee, bound over, page 210. This man was Peter Williamson who as a child in 1743 was captured in Aberdeen and sold as a slave to the planter, a white guinea man. The planter was destined for America with 70 other kidnapped Scottish children, in addition to the other freight. After 11 weeks at sea, the ship ran aground on a sandbar near Cape May on the Delaware River. As it began to take on water, the crew fled in a lifeboat, leaving the boys to drown in the sinking ship. The planter managed to stay afloat until morning, however, and the slavers returned to salvage their cargo. Peter Williamson was twice blessed. He not only survived the planter, but had the great good fortune to have been purchased by a former slave, Hugh Wilson, who had also been kidnapped in Scotland as a child. Wilson had fled slavery in another colony and now bought Williamson in Pennsylvania. He did so solely out of compassion, knowing the boy would be bought by someone else had Wilson not bought him first. Wilson paid for Williamson's education in a colonial school and years later, on his death, bequeathed to the lad his horse, saddle, and a small sum of money, all Wilson had in the world. With this advantage, Williamson married, became an Indian fighter on the frontier, and eventually made his way back to Scotland seeking justice for himself and on behalf of all kidnapped children, including his deceased friend, Hugh Wilson. This took the form of a book, The Life and Curious Adventures of Peter Williamson, who was carried off from Aberdeen and sold for a slave. Isn't that interesting? He became an Indian fighter. Why, why would he do that? Why would he want to go out and fight such noble, peaceful people? <laughs> That's funny. But when he attempted to distribute it in Aberdeen, he was arrested on the charge of publishing a, now check this out, scurrilous and infamous libel reflecting greatly upon the character and reputations of the merchants of Aberdeen. The book was ordered to be publicly burned at Williamson and Williamson jailed. He was eventually fined and banished from the city. Williamson did not give up, but sued the judges of Aberdeen and took sworn statements from people who had witnessed kidnappings or who had had their own children snatched by slavers. Typical was the testimony of William Jameson of Old Meldrum, a farming village 12 miles from Aberdeen. In 1741, Jamieson's 10-year-old son, John, was captured by a spirit gang in the employ of Bonnie John Burnett, a powerful slave merchant based in Aberdeen. After making inquiries, Jamieson learned that his son was being held for shipment on the plantations Jamieson hurried to Aberdeen and frantically searched the docks and ships for his boy. He found him on shore among a circle of about sixty six zero other boys, guarded by Bonnie John's slavers who brandished horse whips. When the boys walked outside the circle, they were whipped. Jamieson called to his son to come to him. The boy tried to run to his father. Father and son were beaten to the ground by the slavers. Jamieson sought a writ from the Scottish courts, but was informed, quote, that it would be vain for him to apply to the magistrate to get his son liberate, because some of the magistrates had a hand in these doings. Jamieson never saw his son alive again having never heard of him since he was carried away. 
The testimony from Jamieson and from others helped Peter Williamson to prevail. The Aberdeen merchants were ordered by the Edinburgh Court of Sessions to pay him one hundred pound. Williamson was personally vindicated and his book was printed in a new edition. The kidnapping continued, however. The enslavement of white children from Great Britain later became the subject of a much better known book, Robert Louis Stevenson's Kidnapped, which was based on the real-life case of James Annesley, whose uncle, the Earl of Anglesey, had arranged for him to be seized and sold into slavery in America in order to remove any challenge to the Earl's inheritance of his brother's estates. <laughs> Get that. People are rotten. <clears throat> Annesley was savagely whipped and brutally mistreated in America, and it appeared he would die in chains. He was eventually resold to another master who accepted his story that he was an English lord and the heir to the Anglesey barony. Annesley managed to make his way back to Scotland, where he wrote a book, Memoirs of, a, of an Unfortunate Young Nobleman Returned from Thirteen Years' Slavery in America, which years later came to the attention of Robert Louis Stevenson. Unfortunately, this rare case involving the enslavement of a member of the English nobility attracted attention only because it involved royalty, the far more common plight of hundreds of thousands of poor British children who had languished and died in slavery in the colonies was ignored, and awareness of the history of their ordeal remained unchanged in the wake of the publication of Stevenson's classic. The head of one kidnapping ring, John Stewart, sold at least 500 white youths per year into slavery in the colonies. Stewart's thugs were paid 25 shillings for whites they produced by force, usually a knock in the head with a blunt instrument or fraud. Stewart sold the whites to the masters of the white guineamen slave ships for 40 shillings each. One eyewitness to the mass kidnapping of poor whites estimated that 10,000 were sold into slavery every year from throughout Great Britain. Information in a pamphlet by M. Godwin, London, 1680. All right, white losses in the middle passage higher than that of blacks. White slaves transported to the colonies suffered a staggering loss of life in the 17th and 18th century. During the voyage to America, it was customary to keep the white slaves below deck for the entire nine to twelve week journey. A white slave would be confined to a hole not more than sixteen feet long, chained with fifty other men to a board with padlocked collars around their necks. The weeks of confinement below deck in the ship's stifling hold often resulted in outbreaks of contagious disease which would sweep through the cargo of white freight chained in the bowels of the ship. Ships carrying white slaves to America often lost half their slaves to death. According to historian Sharon V. Salinger, quote, scattered data reveal that the mortality for white servants at certain times equaled that for black slaves in the middle passage and during other periods actually exceeded the death rate for black slaves. From Salinger, page 91. Salinger reports a death rate of 10 to 20 percent over the entire 18th century for black slaves on board ships en route to America compared with a death rate of 25 percent for white slaves en route to America. Salinger, page 92. Foster R. Dulles, writing in Labor in America, a History, page 6, states that whether convicts, children spirited from the countryside, or political prisoners, 
white slaves experienced discomforts and sufferings on their voyage across the Atlantic that paralleled the cruel hardships undergone by Negro slaves on the notorious Middle Passage. Dulles says the whites were indiscriminately herded aboard the White Guineamen, often as many as 300 passengers, passengers on little vessels of not more than 200 tons burden, overcrowded, unsanitary. The mortality rate was sometimes as high as 50%, and young children seldom survived the horrors of a voyage which might last anywhere from 7 to 12 weeks. Independent investigator A. B. Ellis in the Argosy writes concerning the transport of white slaves, quote, the human cargo, many of whom were still tormented by unhealed wounds, could not all lie down at once without lying on each other. They were never suffered to go on deck. The hatchway was constantly watched by sentinels armed with hangers and blunderbusses. In the dungeons below, all was darkness, stench, lamentation, disease, and death. Marcus Jernigan describes the greed of the shipmasters, which led to horrendous loss of life for white slaves transported to America. The voyage over often repeated the horrors of the famous Middle Passage of slavery fame. An average cargo was 300, but the shipmaster, for greater profit, would sometimes crowd as many as 600 into a small vessel. The mortality under such circumstances was tremendous, sometimes more than half. Middleburger, an eyewitness, says he saw 32 children thrown into the ocean during one voyage. From Jernigan, pages 50 and 51. The mercantile firms, as importers of white servants, were not too careful about their treatment, as the more important purpose of the transaction was to get ships over to South Carolina, which could carry local produce back to Europe. Consequently, the Irish, as well as others, suffered greatly. It was almost as if the British mer merchants had redirected their vessels from the African coast to the Irish coast, with the white servants coming over in much the same fashion as the African slaves. From Warren B. Smith, page 42. A study of the Middle Passage of White Slaves was included in Parliamentary Petition of 1659. It reported that white slaves were locked below deck for two weeks while the slave ship was still in port. Once under way, they were all the way locked up under decks, amongst ho horses. They were chained from their legs to their necks. Transport, travel in double irons, were whipped and beaten. Captains such as Edward Brockett of the Rappahannock Merchant were totally unfit. Eckridge, page 101, of the white slaves bound for Maryland from London aboard the slave ship Justitia at the mercy of the savage Captain Barnett Bond, nearly one-third of the whites died. The very worst excesses were revealed during the voyage of the Justitia. I don't know if I should call it Justitia or Justitia. I'm going to call it the Justitia. Sorry. The very worst excesses were revealed during the voyage of the Justitia, 1743, under the command of Barnett Bond. Bond set stringent water rations. Despite ample reserves of water on board, he allotted each transport only one pint a day. Some started to drink their own urine. Eckridge, page 102. <clears throat> the former partner 
of Andrew Reed of the white slave trading firm of Reed and Armour wrote that Reed was, quote, a person against whom every species of complaint was made. Profits continued to flow in spite of the deaths of what the white slave trade from firm of Stevenson, Randolph, and Cheston referred to as, quote, the goods, unquote. The traffic in these goods properly managed will in a few years make us very genteel fortunes. The sales of the convicts run up amazingly in a little time. From William Stevenson to James Cheston, September 12th, 1768 and December 30th, 1769. Cheston Galloway Papers, Maryland Historical Society. I want you to note dear listener, that these things are happening en masse, this white slavery going on prolifically even seven years before the revolution, the American Revolution. And by the way, and I'm going to make a note, and I'm going to try to get a hold of some of this because it's, it's out there. There were a lot of wars and battles fought in the early colonies. Most of them fought concerning the massive profits that these people that uh, Hoffman is referring to uh, as, as aristocrats were making, um, lords of colonies and the sort of sacrifices that they were willing to make of their own people, and of course, as we're seeing here, especially of whites, was beyond belief. And so many wars, many skirmishes, um, many battles did take place in the early colonies that, of course, none of us have ever heard the first thing about. Now, once the slave ships left British shores, quote, profit rather than penal policy shaped the character of transportation. And what happened to enslaved whites overseas, quote, mattered little. As soon as they were safely consigned to merchants, authorities assumed no responsibility for their welfare. From Eckridge, page 3. White slaves aboard ship were treated worse than dogs or swine, and are kept much more uncleanly than those animals are. Uh, from Shaw, page 35. A witness who saw a white slave aboard a ship owner <clears throat> by the slaver John Stewart reported, quote, All the states of horror I ever had an idea of are much short of what I saw this man in. Chained to a board in a hole not above 16 feet long, more than 50 with him, a collar and padlock about his neck, and chained to five of the most dreadful creatures I ever looked on. Another observer watching the auction of a hundred white slaves in Williamsburg, Virginia, remarked, quote, I never seen such passels of poor wretches in my life, some almost naked. Eckridge, pages 100 and 122. One white woman slave bound for Australia, Elizabeth uh, Dudgeon, had dared to talk back to a guard. She was trussed up to a ship's grating and mercilessly whipped. One of the ship's officers relished watching her lashed. Quote, the corporal did not play with her, but laid at home, which I was very glad to see. She has long been fishing for it, which she has at last got to her heart's content. From the Journal of Ralph Clark, entry of July 3, 1787. In order to realize the maximum profit from the trade in white slaves, the captains 
of the white guineamen crammed their ships with as many poor whites as possible, certain that even with the most callous disregard for their lives of the whites, the financial gain would still make the trip worth the effort. A loss of 20% of their white cargo as regarded as acceptable, but sometimes losses were much higher. Out of 350 white slaves, on a ship bound for the colonies in 1638, only 80 arrived alive. We have thrown overboard two and three in a day for many days together, wrote Thomas Roos, a survivor of the trip. A ship carrying white slaves in 1685, the Betty of London, left England with 100 white slaves and arrived in the colonies with 49 left. A number of factors contributed to the higher death rates for white slaves than blacks. Although the goal of maximum profits motivated both trades, it cost more to obtain blacks from Africa than it did to capture whites in Europe. White slaves were not cared for as well as blacks because the whites were cheaply obtained and were viewed as expendable. The African slave trade was not fully established in the early 17th century. The price of African slaves was prohibitively high and the English were neither familiar with nor committed to black slavery as a basic institution. From Beckel's White Servitude, page 3. Ship captains involved in white slave trade obtained white slaves with penal status either free of charge or were subsidized to take them, and for all other categories of white slaves they paid at most a small sum to an agent to procure them, forfeiting only the cost of their keep on board ship if they died. Moreover, Traders and black slaves operated ships designed solely for the purpose of carrying human cargo with the intent of creating conditions whereby as many black slaves as possible would reach America alive. White slave ships were cargo ships with no special provisions for passengers. In addition, Transportation rules decreed that, in cases where white slaves were sold in advance to individual planters in America, if the white slave survived the voyage beyond the halfway point in the journey, the planter in America, not the captain of the slave ship, would be responsible for the costs of the white slave's provisions, whether or not the slave survived the trip. Captains of the slave ships became infamous for providing sufficient food for only the first half of the trip and then virtually starving their white captives until they arrived in America. Jammed into filthy holds, manacled, starved and abused, they suffered and died during the crossings in gross numbers. Thousands were children under 12 snatched off the streets. The transportation became a profitable enterprise. Traders delivered thousands of bound laborers to Pennsylvania and exhibited a callous disregard for their cargoes. From Salinger, page 88. As a result, white slaves on board these ships suffered a high rate of disease. Transportation of white slaves remained a branch of commerce wedded to carrying human cargoes at minimal expense. Sizable numbers never reached American shores from disease, mistreatment, from Eckrich, page 108. The number of diseased white slaves arriving was high enough for Pennsylvania officials to recommend a quarantine law for them. Thus, a new torment was to be endured for white slaves who, quote, were often stopped just short of the new world with land in sight and forced to remain quarantined on board ships in which they had 
just spent a horrifying 10 to 12 weeks from Salinger, page 89. In 1738, Dr. Thomas Graham reported to the Colonial Council of Pennsylvania that if two ships crammed with white slaves were allowed to land, quote, it might prove dangerous to the health of the inhabitants of this province. From minutes of the Provincial Council of Pennsylvania, Colonial Records, 4 colon 306. Ships filled with the diseased white slaves landed anyways. In 1750, an island was established for their quarantine, Fisher Island, at the mouth of the Schuylkill, Sh Schuylkill. That is a rough one right there. I don't know how you're supposed to put those letters together and make a word. Schuylkill River, <laughs> but the establishment of the quarantine area did nothing to protect the health of the white slaves, and the island was more typical of Devil's Island than a place of recuperation. In 1764, a clergyman, Pastor Helmuth, visited Fisher Island and described it as, quote, a land of the living dead, a vault full of living corpses. <clears throat> so, now I know that um, the people who participated in this uh, slave trade, they're no longer alive, obviously, but there are many alive still today who are participating in sickening, disgusting, depraved, inhuman trafficking of souls. Now, this I'm aiming directly at you. Not that anyone who's involved with that might be listening to this now, but maybe, maybe at some point, if someone who has in any way been involved in the exploitation or victimization of those weaker than themselves. And that is exactly what is going on here. Those weaker than others were taken by force, mistreated, murdered, used, abused, often raped, molested, treated as an object. I want to read the words again of the laws of Yahweh so that you can understand that Yahweh lives. His Christ, His Anointed One, sits at His right hand and if he does not return with force in your lifetime, you can bet that after you die and sleep the sleep of the dead, you will be resurrected. You will stand before him. You will give account. You will be punished and your punishment will be fitting the only consolation I could offer someone like you who would do things like this is that you ought to be though you probably will not be thankful that you stand before the God of Israel, a merciful God. But don't let that go to your head. He is merciful. He takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. But know this, he will destroy. He will avenge. He hears the cries 
of widows and children orphaned. He will avenge. So take heed of his words. Hear the word of Yahweh, Exodus 22, 22. You shall not take advantage of any widow or fatherless child. If you take advantage of them at all, and they cry at all to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will grow hot, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. Now, let me go on a bit further to all of you who call yourselves Christians, and then you go out into the world every week in between your playing nice and clean and good on Sundays, and you do every rotten practice that you are told not to do. If you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor, you shall not be to him as a creditor. You shall not charge him interest. Do you call yourself a servant of Jesus Christ and the living God and work at a bank who makes loans on interest, a credit company that makes loans on interest, a payday loans place, checks for cash, interest, interest, interest. Is your income based on usury? Other people's pain. Widows, fatherless children, the poor. If so, you have no right to call yourself a son of God. You must repent. You must, or you will be destroyed. What I desire, what I desire, is for men to repent. I desire for my, my people to repent, to return to the living God, to confess their sins and put their faith in his Christ, to be baptized for the remission of sins, and to walk even as Christ walked. And we know that Christ perfectly kept the law. That's the way he walked. Walk as he walked. Love your brother in particular and show goodness to all men. I'm going to wait to pick up next time with the chapter white slaves treated worse than blacks and i want to again remind you of the words of sheldon emery you you listening whether you be white and ashamed of whites because you've been lied to and programmed and taught that you were privileged because of your skin color or whether you be black and you have been programmed and taught that whites are more privileged than you and that you have somehow been wrongfully oppressed or whether you are any other color nationality and background under the sun take care to note the words of Sheldon Emery and prove him wrong if you can. 
you can search the pages of history in every library in the world and you will find no record of the people of any other race making any effort to help those of a race other than their own. It is only the white race which has given its religion, its talents, its money, and its material wealth to every race on the globe. So, whether you have an ancestry of white, Caucasian, Anglo-Saxon, thus the Twelve Tribes, whether your ancestry is Southern European and mixed, mixed Arab, Black African, any sort of Asian, uh, American Aborigine, does not matter. Are you going to take your stand with the people of the living God, or are you not? Remember, not all those who are of Israel, are Israel. Take no pride nor shame in your flesh. Are you going to stand with Israel, or are you going to stand against Israel? And believe me, I'm not talking about that country over there on the east side of the Mediterranean, full of murderous perverts who call themselves Israel because not a one of them are Israel. The Palestinians that they're murdering have more blood tied to Abraham than those sick beasts. When I say Israel, I'm talking about the tribes of Israel, the Caucasians. Because if you have not Christ, it doesn't matter what your ancestry is. But I want you to know your ancestry. I want you to be empowered by the knowledge of who you are and where you came from. Be proud of it. Be, be glad. Be glad to the living God and his Messiah. Because perhaps for you, your redemption draws near, I hope. And again, if that is not your ancestry, you still may put your faith in the Messiah of Israel, Jesus of Nazareth. Stand with Israel and be counted among the saints. <clears throat> no less than remember Yahweh tells Israel and throughout the Tanakh he didn't pick Israel because there was anything special anything wonderful about Israel he did it to glorify his own name in the earth and we were picked for a certain purpose that we would carry his word, um, who he is, uh, the good news of his Messiah and his Messiah's kingdom to the whole world. So we have a responsibility. So until next time, I hope this has empowered you, given you a lot of food for thought, and I suggest you read your Bible and question 
everything you have been told, taught, and programmed. And do well, if you are of the household of the saints, do especially good towards them. But do well towards all men. Love the truth, and the truth will love you back. <laughs>